and welcome to Hype Train. In tonight's episode, we've got a Geography Now India this time. Another highly requested. We've had quite a few of the Geography Nows requested, haven't we? We certainly have, yes. India was definitely one of the first put up there by the comments after we did the first one. Um, obviously, we're covering Nightwish here, so we are probably going to cover the Finland at some point soon as well. Yes, we've been asked. We that. don't know if we're going to cover every country. We don't even know if we've got time to do that. There's a lot of countries, and uh, to be fair, Barbie and co are still going through them all as they, as they speak. So That's it, yeah, I don't think they've been through half. Or any they've been through a good, aren't they? No, they've yeah. been up to Portugal. So, mm. United States it'll probably be. So, we'll yeah. get to United Kingdom first, and then it'll be the United States. Oh. So, and we'll probably not definitely cover them in the future. Well, it'll yeah. be some time from now, but yeah, we're dribbling. Should we go for it, Kev? Let's take a look. So, we have finally encroached upon the giant India. Some of you have been waiting a long time for this episode. <laughs> I'm just gonna say straight up, you all know India is incredibly complex and diverse. Even Indians have trouble understanding their own country. Obviously, right. I won't be able to scratch even the surface in this episode, but I'll try my best. A lot of you Indian geography peeps have helped me along the way, so thank you, and without further ado, let's begin. This is gonna be quick, I okay, so to to geography now. Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbie. This place doesn't even need much of an introduction. Everybody has heard of India. It's big, it's loud, it's colorful, and most importantly, it has a plethora of confusing territorial anomalies that I just can't wait to cover. Here we go. Mm. There's an old saying, India is a place where everyone is in a hurry, but no one is ever on time. First of all, <laughs> India is located in South Asia, right on the Indian and Arabian Seas and the Bay of Bengal, bordered by six other countries, so close to seven, but that land bridge between Sri Lanka <laughs> got wiped away like 600 years ago by a cyclone. Wow. India is divided into 29 states and seven union territories with the capital New Delhi, which acts as its own administrative unit located in the capital territory. Keep in mind, New Delhi is actually just the name of one of the districts in the capital territory made up of 11. The largest city, however, is actually Mumbai with New Delhi, Bangalore or Bengaluru and Hyderabad following after. However, the four busiest airports are Delhi Indira Gandhi International, Mumbai's Chhatrapati Shivaji International, Bengaluru's Kempe Golda International, and Chennai International. Uh, you know why I'm smiling. Yeah. This is my favorite part of any episode we ever make. Territorial anomaly time. India is loaded with strange borders and deliciously complex demarcation lines. First of all, what exactly is a union territory? In the simplest way I can put this, union territories are places that are too distinct to be incorporated into a state but too small to have their own local governments. The first one, of course, is the Delhi National Capital Territory, where the capital lies. Chandigarh is a post-independent city constructed to replace Lahore as the capital of the Punjab area after it was split up between India and Pakistan. Then you have the island territories, the smallest one, Lakshadweep, and the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. The Andaman oh. Islands being home to one of the last uncontacted people groups on the planet, the Sentinelese tribe, whom have been hostile to visitors and are therefore left alone. As well as the oh, Nicobar Islands, enough. which actually used to be a short-lived colony of Denmark. Finally, the three remaining territories are former European colony towns and ports. Dadra and Nagar Haveli, Daman and Diu, which are separated by about 200 kilometers across the Gulf of Kambat, and the most confusing union territory, the French-speaking Puducherry, which is actually split up between four French district speaking. cities across India. Karikal, Mahe, Yanaon, and Pondicherry. Pondicherry is strange because it has 11 enclaves within the Tamil Nadu state. Oh, and in this area, you can also find that experimental hippie-ish commune with a little bit of controversy. Look it up. Oh, and don't forget, here, the eastern states, also known as the Seven Sisters, are connected by this incredibly narrow 27 kilometer wide pathway known as the Siliguri Corridor. This pathway is like a crucial artery that completes the India puzzle. Or yeah. so you would think. Now let's discuss the juicy stuff. Now in the China episode, I already talked about the disputed areas with India, such as Aksai Chin and Arunachal Pradesh. The latter pretty much just belonging to India as it's almost completely inhabited and operated by Indians. So let's move to the other disputes. Now as of 2015, the Bangladesh episode is already outdated as India and Bangladesh have finally come to an agreement <laughs> over the frighteningly complex former enclave-exclave dispute. In the end, India only lost about 40 square kilometers of land to Bangladesh, and now only a few enclaves and exclaves exist. Now let's head north. Now when you try to draw the shape of India, you might want to be careful which depiction you use. Some might use this picture, some might use this, some might use this, and those that don't really study very well might use this. The point <laughs> is, the whole area is like the most heavily militarized, diplomatically stressed out region on the planet. It's already had like four wars in the past half century. Basically, India, Pakistan, and to some extent China all want the entire area for themselves, although it's more of like a Pakistan-India thing. In the China episode, we already discussed the Chinese disputes with India, so I won't cover those in this episode. If you want to learn more, just watch the China episode. But anyway, this entire the era was a former domain known as the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir that was under royal Maharaja rulers all the way up until independence. Currently, this place is split up by this fenced off militarized line known as the line of control between India and Pakistan. Why is this? Well, in the quickest way I can put this, okay, the British are out, we get to take your land. Uh, no, we want to be an independent princely state. Uh, we're supposed to take your land and majority of your people are Muslim, just like us, even though your ruler is Hindu as well. 
Hey, India? Yeah? If you help me, I'll let you secede my territory to your land with autonomy. Deal. <laughs> ha! Your problem now! I love how Mike played India. He totally represents India. Oh, and keep in mind, Pakistan's capital, Islamabad, is less than 80 kilometers away from all that drama. The line of control meanders through the mountains until it stops at a point called NJ9842. This is where things get really crazy, because from there you the hit the CHN Glacier, the second highest yeah. non-polar yeah. glacier in the world, and this is pretty much the dead man zone. After point NJ9842, you hit the actual ground position line, a series of military outposts that extend all the way to the Chinese border. That means everything in this area is ground zero for the indo pac tension. And you know, the crazy thing is there's actually literally small towns of normal, regular civilians living in these areas high up in the mountains, many of which just go about daily life, going to work and raising their families. Otherwise, they have a river dispute with Nepal and various river islands disputed with Bangladesh. Outside of all the dispute stuff though, India not only has the world's second largest road network and three of the world's top 10 mega cities and their own space program, but they also have a copious abundance of landmarks and notable sites, way too many to list. But some of the ones that you guys, the Indian geography have told me to mention include places like the abandoned Danush Kodi ghost city, Golconda Fort, the four pillars of Charminar, wow. Yajanta oh, Buddhist beautiful. art caves, the Alora monolithic ruins, oh, yeah. Mandu oh, Fortress, yeah. the Golden Fantastic. Temple, which feeds over 100,000 people a day, the Golgumbaz Mausoleum, the Kalavantin Durg Post, the ruins of Hampi, the hill forts of Rajasthan, Shaturunjaya Hill, Whoa, which is basically like a like that for chains, the Temple of the Bodhi Tree, Jal Mahal, Bangart Fort, the most haunted place in India, <laughs> Mahabad <laughs> Magbara, and keep in mind, just like in beautiful China, you can find a great wall of India in Rajasthan. There's also the Paritala Anjanea Temple with the largest statue in India depicting Hanuman and at over 150 acres the Sri Rangan Ataswami Temple I would the largest love to Hindu say temple yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, there's also that building with the stuff and the thing whatever anyway we could go on for centuries talking about India's rich constructed domicile but what it lies on top of is even more fascinating wow mm. now don't make this mistake i'm going to india all i need are my sandals and sunscreen <laughs> Oh, <laughs> As the seventh largest country in land area, India has a wide range of landscapes, climates, and elevations that all contrast from one corner to the other. First of all, let's talk about the north. India sits on the Indian tectonic plate that essentially smashed into the Eurasian plate, which in return created the largest mountain range in the world, the Himalayas. The force is so strong that it's estimated that the Himalayas grow about 2.4 inches or 6.1 centimeters every year. There's also where you can find Kanchenjunga, okay. the tallest mountain in India, or the third in the world, right on the border of Nepal. Keep your eye on these mountains. These are pretty much the source of most of India's major rivers that give life to the whole country. That's why India takes these mountains so seriously. You can also find the largest natural lake, Wular, up in the Jammu Kashmir area. Below the Himalayas, you reach the North Indian River Plain, sometimes referred to as the Indus Ganga. This is the most fertile part of India where the most important rivers like the Ganges and its tributaries flow. Heading a little south, you reach the Satpura and Vindhya ranges that pretty much divide North India from South India. On each side, you get the West and East Ghat Mountains, which in return creates this massive triangle thing called the Deccan Plateau. This place is moderately forest, especially in the East in the Chotra Nagpur Plateau, where you get a section of the swampy Sundarbans that they share with Bangladesh. Check out the Bangladesh episode. Mm. Head a little west and you get the dry Tar Desert along the border with Pakistan, as well as the Ran of Kutch, known as the Salt Desert. And finally, the only active volcanic area would be the Adaman and Nicobar Islands, surface, with Barren so, Island yeah. having actual <laughs> conical eruptions and Bharatan having wow. tame mud volcanoes. Now here's the thing, although India has a relatively high population density, they do relatively yeah. well with maintaining their ecological footing. In fact, in 2016, they beat a world record by planting, disputably, 50 million trees in one day. They've also agreed to reforest about 12% of their country by 2030. The most heavily forested area being the seven sister states in East India. Now, one of the factors that contributes to this would be the fact that India has the lowest meat consumption in the world with the highest population percentage of vegetarians at around 40%, most of whom are lacto-vegetarians that consume milk products. By the way, in India, when buying groceries, this label means vegetarian and this one means not vegetarian. Nonetheless, the remainder of the population does typically eat some kind of animal protein, mostly in the forms of seafood or chicken, but almost never beef or pork unless if you are part of the Muslim or Christian minorities scattered throughout the West and East areas. Now, let's talk about the role of cattle, shall we? India has more cattle and livestock than anywhere else in the world, around 330 that. million. Like and it's interesting because since they have prevalent Hindu traditions, the killing of cows is illegal in many of the states except for a few, and each state has varying degrees of punishment for committing intentional cow slaughter. Keyword cool. intentional. Cows accidentally get hit by cars all the time. Once a cow is too old to produce milk, it typically is released into the open to die naturally in the wild, ideally. Nonetheless, male cattle get it much worse as 
they are deemed as kind of useless. Some places use them as draft animals for labor. Some religious sects use them as sacrifices, but otherwise they are typically sold to the underground market for beef or hides. To this day, there are about six times as many female cows as male cattle in India. So that means, yeah, something's happening to the males. Nonetheless, India does have the third highest carbon emission rate after China and the US, fourth if you consider the EU. However, emission per capita, they rank pretty low at only about two kilotons per person. Contrast that with Qatar at about 40. There are 94 Oof. national parks, 501 animal sanctuaries across the country where you can find some of the national animals like the peacock, the Ganges River dolphin, the king cobra, the Indian elephant, and the highest population wow. of Bengal oh, tigers in the I? world, yeah. which are all highly protected. India also has the most irrigated land in the world, which allows them to become the number one producer of multiple products like millet, bananas, lemons, limes, mangoes, ginger, chickpeas, milk, butter, fennel, jute, yeah. and about 75% of the world's spices alone come from India. Speaking of which, food! Typically, you can find the staples roti, chapati, and naan in the north, idli and dosa in the south, and everybody eats rice. The more commonly commercialized Indian foods that we in the yeah. west grew up with, like samosas, that, tikka that, masala, so. tandoori, yeah, and a... my favorite Indian dish, palak paneer, these usually mm. come from the northern what regions of India. Mm. Seriously, India, you took spinach and made it fat. I love you guys. <laughs> Otherwise, the West <laughs> okay. is mostly known for Maybe the Chinese and pickled then. foods as well as beef mm -hmm. since there's a high number of Muslims and Christians. The South uses a lot more coconut and has some of the best curries like poriyals, sambras, rasams, and tutus. And the East is known for having the best desserts like peda, mishti doi, rasgula, or shondesh. Speaking of which, India is so diverse and complex that sometimes even Indian people need translators when going to different states. <laughs> it's about to get 10 times oh. more confusing in about three, Makes two, me feel better, one. Then. <laughs> That's actually uh, really intriguing to see how that and that bit about the 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 animals, the cows, the cow. I didn't actually yeah. know they just roam around around the. Yeah, park. I didn't know I, that. I, 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 oh yeah, I see a program where where I can't think who it was now, and they went to this wedding, and there's like a you, you if you don't it ain't like consummated or something until the cow walks in or whatever they put. Excuse me. It's yeah, it's basically it walks into the. The building they sort of have it really yeah and they were walking around and they weren't allowed to hurt them or anything so oh no i can see that already the yeah. punishments i don't think about what the punishments would be unless yeah. they can't you know they're no good for it's why it's strange but... like the un under sort of the black market there was meat there weren't there yeah. <laughs> that's a bit strange yeah, but... that was good no uh, no no it's great stuff mm. Shashi Turur once said, in India, we celebrate the commonality of major differences. We are a land of belonging rather than blood. First of all, India has a population of about 1.3 billion people and is the second most populous country in the world after China with about 18% of the world's population. Wow. About 72% of the country is Indo-Aryan and a quarter are Dravidian, and the majority of the remainder are Mongoloid, Asian, and other people groups. They also use the Indian rupee as their currency, they use the Type C, D, and M plug outlets, and they drive on the left side of the road. By the way, technically it's illegal for these banknotes to leave the country, but you guys have sent me a lot of them for fan mail for fan friday videos so i don't want to go to jail <laughs> again now keep in mind those okay, statistics that i just mentioned are incredibly we'll right driving out of there, the then. indo aryan and yeah, Dravidian the communities yeah. there are about yeah. 2,000 different ethno-linguistic yeah. people groups in india with about 645 district indigenous tribes 52 major ones so obviously we can't cover them all but what yeah. we do know is that the north is very different from the south for one the north mostly speaks in languages that are all related to the indo aryan branch with languages like hindi bengali punjabi and gujarati whereas the south speaks a completely unintelligible dravidian branch with languages like tamil telugu Malay. Ayalam and Kannada. <laughs> Canada. Otherwise, there's also pockets of Sino-Tibetan and Austro-Asiatic languages spoken in the far north and east. Wait, so how do they all, like, communicate with each other? Great question! Although India does not have an official language, there are 22 recognized national languages, and of these, two are the most prevalent, taught in schools and used by government officials, Hindi and English. And very often, these two are, like, mixed mid-sentence. It's weird. Don't be surprised if you hear someone speaking Hindi and then suddenly finishing off in English. Oh, it's right. like, it's up with a good subject, it's worse. And I was like, but this, and I was like, trying to, like, why are you even trying to do that? I know, right? <laughs> And the washing machine, I told them, but I said, I'm going to a bomb tag it with a chainsaw. A lot, now, of course, let's discuss the one English, thing that goes hand in hand with India Hindu. Hinduism. About 80% of India claims to be Hindu, or at least part of the Hindu practicing community. Now, we don't have time to explain everything about the tenets and multi layered philosophies and practices of Hinduism. If you want to know, just talk to a Hindu person. But basically, mm. one thing you do need to know is that Hindu driven ideologies pretty much dominate most of life in India, everything from family to business. You will see colorful, mesmerizing shrines, temples, statues, and rituals There's being performed everywhere, well. even in public. On the Bharat Mata, the wow, mother of India that. statues are everywhere. She's like the symbol of India. The largest Hindu pilgrimage, the Kumela, happens every three years, 
rotating between four cities in which the adherents cool. bathe in the Ganges River and enjoy a massive festival with tens of millions of people. Like, seriously, you can practically see it happening from space. Now, a controversial topic in relation to Hinduism would be the caste system, which is basically a belief that people are born into a socioeconomic life that they are destined to serve into. Today, however, the system is more fluid and loose from what it used to be from a long time ago. And thanks to economic reforms, anybody with enough drive can kind of move up the social ladder regardless of birth. Nonetheless, India is home to every major religion in the world, even a few Jews, including the Benai Menashe, an indigenous group that claimed to be one of the lost tribes of Israel. In fact, Judaism and Christianity actually had a head start in India way before it even kicked off in Europe. As tradition holds, Cochin, or Malabar Jews, migrated around 1000 BC to trade during the times of King Solomon. And in 53 AD, Thomas, the apostle of Jesus, arrived in what is now the state of Kerala to establish the first church in India. Today, most Christians are found in the southwest and far east Seven Sisters regions. India also holds the highest population of Sikhs, Jains, and Zoroastrians, mostly found in the north, and the second largest Muslim population in the world after Indonesia. Most Muslims are populated around the northwest areas by Pakistan or in the east by Bangladesh. Oh, and don't forget the Buddhists. In fact, Buddhism actually started in India. Today, the Dalai Lama even takes refuge in Tespur in the state of Assam. Oh, that was a lot of information. Ah! Okay, so by now you can probably get a grasp of how incredibly mixed and diversified India's population is, but what exactly holds the country together? Well, for one, you kind of have to understand Indian history, which will take way too long to explain, but in the quickest way I can put it, Indus Valley, Maurya and Gupta empires, Southern empires, Golden Age, Middle Kingdoms, a ton of new religions come flocking in, the North fell to the <laughs> Delhi Sultanate, the South became the Vijaya Nagara Empire, the Mughal Empire starts, British East India Company, direct British rule, nationalist yeah, movements, I know independence, got deep republic, history. economic mm, liberalization in 1991, and here we are today. <laughs> Vijaya. <laughs> Essentially, India used to be made up of around 500 smaller royal princely states, and when the British came in, they kind of exploited them to manage such a huge population. Although India is a democratic federal republic and the largest democracy in the world, the old royal families still exist today, and although they have no political power, they hold high positions of influence in their communities across India. So today, technically, you could meet someone that would be considered an Indian prince or princess. Nonetheless, the biggest thing that really united Indians in the past two centuries would probably be their hatred of British rule. It was kind of like, well, this is not cool. Yep. <laughs> what do you say you and I work together in a, end this thing? Essentially, one good thing you could say that came out of imperialism was that it kind of stopped all the internal squabbling and unified the groups towards one common goal, to get rid of imperialism. Today, Indians are just proud to be Indian. I mean, a Tamil soccer player can get cheered on by a Rajasthani. A Punjabi pop star can sell out tickets in Orissa. Speaking of which, all Indians love movies and music. India has the second largest film industry in terms of volume, pumping out nearly 2,000 films per year. Oh, Surprisingly, Nigeria pumps really out more. Our box of office yeah. revenues gross out at only about $2 billion annually compared to Hollywood at over 10 billion, but still, it's uh, impressive. And keep in mind, it's not just Bollywood, but it's also Tollywood, Gollywood, yeah, Kaliwood, Pollywood, and so on. There's like so 20 different woods in India. Oh, oh, like every movie in India has at least one no. scene where everybody breaks out in song, and there's almost always a happy ending. I love all the music and the Bollywood. Has also put an aesthetic really, 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 the the dance it's almost become great, an obsession yeah. to be light or fair-skinned, mm. causing people to go so far as to buy skin-bleaching products. Some other controversies include things mm. like illiteracy being an issue in many parts of the country, especially in the rural areas. But I mean, come on, when your country has literally hundreds of different writing systems? Go figure, I mean, give them a break. Also, many of you guys, the Indian geography peeps, have asked me to bring awareness to the fact that India does unfortunately have some of the highest rates of human trafficking and child slavery. Uh. The government is trying to crack down and culture is slowly being reformed, but for now, it's a sad reality that still does exist. Hey, here at GN, we talk about the good and the bad, I'm just saying. Otherwise, sports do definitely tie everyone together as well, especially cricket, the national sport, even though they also used yeah, to be really well in field hockey. India also has a lot of their own indigenous sports like Dopkel in Assam, bull racing in Kerala, Insuknar, Rod, pushing in Mizoram, <laughs> Malakamba, the strange pool Whoa! yoga gymnastics thing in the south. Otherwise, some notable people yeah. from India or of Indian descent might include people like Siddhartha Gautama or the Buddha, Mahavir, Ashoka the Great, Prithviraj Chauhan, Aurangzeb, Shivaji of the Maratha Empire, Mohandas or Mahatma Gandhi, Indira Gandhi, Subhash Chandra Bose, Jawahar Lal Nehru, Rabindranath Tagore, C.V. Raman, Satyendra Nath Bose, Bhagat Singh, Dr. A.P.J. Abdul Kalam, Shah Rukh Khan, Amitabh Bachchan, Amir Khan, Salman Khan, Priyana Chopra, Ben Kingsley, Sundar Pichai, ben Satya Kingsley. Narayana Nadella, wow. A.R. Rahman, Sachin Tendulkar, and Mahendra Singh Dhoni. There's also literally millions of other famous people I missed out on. If you want to mention them, please, there's a comment section below. Use it. In the meantime, we got to finish this info marathon, shall we? Yeah, that's, that's going along nice and quickly. Now, no surprise, India is huge and therefore has a huge international outreach when it comes to diplomacy. To almost everyone, 
except their immediate neighbors. First of all, countries with large population percentages of Hindus and Indians like Fiji, Guyana, Suriname, Trinidad and Tobago, Mauritius and Malaysia typically stay close to India's roster of go-to friends. They enjoy cordial relations with trade. Now the UK may have left on a sour note, but they still have a lot of ties to their former colonizer in terms of business and tourism. India is still part of the Commonwealth, not Commonwealth realm, there's a difference. And the UK has over 1.5 million citizens of Indian descent. As mentioned in the China episode, China is kind of like India's I'm only here to do business with you and nothing else friend, as drama still hasn't subsided in regards to the territory conflicts. Now when it comes to the US, things started kind of sour back in the 70s during the Indo-Pak War of 1971, when the US sided with Pakistan, their arch nemesis. Today relations have cooled off, mostly the US supports India's move towards democracy and is a key ally in the military conflicts in the Middle East. When it comes to their best friends, however, most of the Indians I talked to have said Russia and Bhutan. Russia because during the Indo-Pak Wars, Russia came in and supported them and ever since then, each country has held a high position of respect for the other, especially as global superpowers. Bhutan and India signed a treaty of friendship almost immediately after independence. The two countries have shared interests and a currency pegged system as well. Bhutan even supported the annexation of their cousins in the Sikkim state into India as it gave a nice buffer of land from China's stake to their claim. In conclusion, you will not find anywhere else on earth like India. Thousands and millions of people inhabiting a colorful, majestic, green, slightly gritty at times slab of earth, blessed and cursed in so many ways, yet wonderfully harmonized, mostly in a unity unlike anywhere else. Mm. In the end, that's India. In the end. Ah! Stay tuned, boom, boom. Indonesia is coming up next. <laughs> I knew it was big. Oh. And that was absolutely no surprise whatsoever. No. I don't know if it's going to get actually more complex yeah. than that one, if I'm being honest. Um, there are some big countries out there, other than India. You could watch that a few times and still be We said that with the Germany one, Kevin. Kevin. Yeah. I was still lost. I watched that a second yeah, time, I was still I, lost. Yeah, Germany's got a lot of uh, separate areas on that. And that, well, that blows out the water, really, because how, how long would that take to actually tour... Oh, all the country look, and I learn about think. all the different things. No, so the population there is humongous. Areas. And this actual video, you bearing in mind, right now they've just done uh, Poland and Portugal. Yes. So you think going back to India, then this is obviously, I didn't check the date, I'm guessing it was a good couple of years ago. Yeah, I'd imagine so. I'd so so, so obviously response. things have changed since then, apart mm. from the fact that the population is still booming and they're still, yeah, they're still a very wealthy country. The mm. We've all heard about like the PewDiePie versus T series. That T series, now was that, that's out in Asia way somewhere mm -hmm. that way, ain't it? T series. And that's all about music. And I see all yeah. that stuff there about the Bollywood. I do, I do, yeah. I don't go out there and just watch no. Bollywood. But whenever it comes across me, I do enjoy that mm. dance, the music. I, I did see a bit where someone went to Bollywood to like their the digital sort of area and that where they made all the special effects, and that was absolutely stunning. I mean, that, there was just massive. There was hundreds of people in great big rooms with computers, all doing special effects for films alone. <laughs> that was it. So it just shows how big it is out there. I'm, I'd be surprised Huge. if it's not bigger we than know Hollywood that. I think it's if not it as big as Hollywood if but, it isn't it will be but because, going out of America know. it's probably literally the next biggest thing yeah, right now, let's be honest just, we don't get to hear, hear too about too much no. this side of Europe ourselves but we know yeah. it's out there some of the, the buildings there in, in India I can't the, uh, I can't remember the names of all they are absolutely stunning yes. some of them yes there was like the, yeah the one that's built in, inside a rock and it, that's all like the monastery the detail in it, um, there was a program on that over here, and it was absolutely fantastic, wonderful. What what man it. what man can do? Yes, so uh, that'd be great to see that on the Egypt episode, you know, building the pyramids. Imagine you still built there more than oh, anyway, going off the track there. So, but yeah, yeah. Um, so great to watch India. Like I said, we might cover some more geography now, uh, if not now, certainly in the future. But yeah, let us know your thoughts on the India episode in the comments below. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you all soon. Catch you on the flip side.